Thank you for being here. I'd like to call this meeting to order of the Floresville City Council's regular meeting. This is Thursday, May the 11th, 2017. And if you would please rise for the invocation. Our thanks to Mr. Bob Herndon for uh, blessing our meeting. Let us pray, please. I'm most gracious, Heavenly Father, dear Lord. We are so grateful for this day. We thank you for life and we thank you for the sanctity of life. It is my prayer tonight in this meeting that we all conduct ourselves in a business-like manager and not being slightful or hateful to each other and respectful for the things that we have to say. I ask that you be with our city council members, uh, past and present, be full of the citizens of this community as we try to come together and bring our city back to where we know it should be and be made to honor and glory of you. I ask now that you forgive me the many ways I've failed you. I pray in your precious name and for your sake, amen. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Texas Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> we do have a quorum this evening for our meeting in attendance. It's Councilman David Johns, Councilwoman Gloria Cantu, myself, Mayor Sissy Gonzalez Dipple, Councilman Nick Neeson, and Councilman Gerard Jimenez. At this time, I'll open the floor to citizens' comments. <coughs> Excuse me. I ask the citizens if when you come up to the podium if you would state your name. Uh, you do have five minutes and we thank you for your cooperation and we ask for your consideration. So any citizens comments at this moment? Good evening, Mayor, Council. <clears throat> Is it too loud? Yeah, that's good. Okay, the, the reason I'm here uh, before you, you'll, you'll see that uh, there is a schedule of officers training, including myself. And uh, on April the 10th, or excuse me, May the 10th, we received an email from uh, Ms. Turner, uh, effective immediately to cancel all training for our police department. I want to go into detail a little bit and uh, let y'all know how essential this training is to the department and to the officers. Uh, there's a two-year cycle that TCO is uh, regulates our, our commission to the state of Texas. Uh, the cycle is about to end in August. Of course, there are some officers that lack either hours or specific courses to train. <laughs> Uh, as you can see on, on, on the list that I provided you, <clears throat> some of these classes that have been registered go as far as back as August 31st, 2016, which is mine. As you can see, there's another one uh, in May 7th, uh, February 14th, March 27th of this year, and several others that have been scheduled, uh, like the one we're fixing to have here on the 24th and 25th here at the event center. That particular one, which is the Texas Narcotics Officers Association, uh, draws a lot of other officers from other agencies through the state of Texas. This was uh, put together by a former reserve officer by the name of uh, uh, Rudy Glover. I was forgetting his first name, excuse me. And uh, this is sponsored by the TNOA South Region uh, he's been working pretty hard at it. He, finally, we got together with the uh, uh, Roadside Inn Motel to get us a, a better rate on, on uh, rooms, which we were able to. Uh, there has been probably over 40 officers plus that have, have also uh, uh, signed up for this class. So uh, that's going to affect us if, if this uh, does stand, which is a cancellation of these classes. 
Uh, the other important thing is when these officers don't meet the required hours or classes, there is a, a reprimand that is issued by the state of Texas by TICO. Uh, of course, that suspends the officer's license. So you have numerous officers on this list, as you can see, that will be affected by this. Uh, and that means, of course, no officers on the streets. Uh, I asked Ms. Turner today numerous times if she would uh, reconsider this and of course her decision was no. So I'm asking you council to please view this closely, reconsider it on the behalf of the city, not on behalf of me. Okay? Uh, there are many, many other uh, schedulings that are in place. Uh, and there's also a form attached, which is a, a LEOS fund that we call Law Enforcement Officers at Standards of Education, which is provided by Texas uh, State of Comptroller's Office. They provide us money, funds to educate our officers, strictly law enforcement purpose only. Uh, that is based on the number of officers per department. That's how they regulate that. It's also attached to them. That is state funded money, not city money. As you can see, we got $1,543 in that account. And to cancel something very important to not only the city, but the department more so, uh, I don't find it necessary. Uh, and it was based on the uh, supposedly the evaluator's preliminary report that was given to Ms. Turner. Uh, why would a report indicate such is beyond me. I mean, a report, that's the last thing a report should say is no more training for officers for the city of Florida. That's ridiculous. And that's a safety issue, liability issue for the city of Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Since it's not on yeah. the agenda, we can't discuss. Uh, if you'd like to make a citizen's comment about it, you can take your citizen's comment time, but it couldn't be a discussion. Mm -hmm. Do I have to go up there or what? No, you can do it from your, your seat there. Can I do that? Yes. You'll, you'll have five minutes just like any citizen. Councilman, can you please, you have to speak into the microphone. I mean, I don't see uh, why we stopped this train. I was una unaware of that, or were you aware of this? Can you tell us the reason why, Henry? She can't yeah. because it's a comment period, oh, just like any other citizen. You can't, okay. It can't be a discussion, but you're free to express your thoughts and everything on it. <laughs> I just think we shouldn't stop no training. I'm always, that's one of the monies that we set aside for that. You know, for training for the city, uh, for our, our employees and for the police officers. I mean, I think that's, that's something that's necessary for for all our employees, including the police officers. Thank you, Councilman. Our next citizen. I forgot one other thing. Yes, uh, I just remembered. As per the email, all training was canceled. And today we received an email, I don't have a copy, that there's a specific uh, training that's going to take place Tuesday the 16th that we have to attend. So why is all the other training for the officers that is so important canceled and this particular one is going to be allowed to take place in our department, which is something to do with our new system that we're uh, having to punch in with. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Gonzalez. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Mayor, Council, I'm Fred Gonzalez and I live in Floresville. Section 312 of our charter entitled Enforcement of Ordinances, Citizen Rights starts out with the following sentence. City ordinances reflect the needs and wishes of the citizens of Floresville. Clearly, 
the intention of the citizens are key in the enactment and or substantive changes of ordinances. Thus, citizens will have a significant role in such actions. This means that citizens are to be properly apprised of any such actions and given leg legitimate opportunity for input. How does this happen? By taking such actions in open meetings and allowing legitimate input. For this to happen, a key part of these meetings is a notification to the citizens in specific terms of the proposed actions. The law requires sufficient information so that citizens can readily tell what's coming their way, so to speak. So what is sufficient? The Texas Supreme Court ruled in a 1988 case where a school board hired a new superintendent under an agenda item labeled personnel as insufficient, i.e. illegal. The reason? Hiring of a superintendent had much higher public interest than just general personnel matters. At your 27, 27 April meeting, the council approved five new or significantly altered ordinances, some of which imposed significant requirements on citizens, and you did it with the following notification. CNA to approve ordinances as discussed at the March 30 workshop. That was it. Can you honestly say that meets the sufficiency requirement? But giving the benefit of the doubt that the workshop reference was key. Let's look at that notification. And I'm quoting verbatim. Proposed Municode codification and changes. Again, what does that mean? Again, as, as you can understand, on it again, can you honestly say that one meets the sufficiency standard? Can you honestly believe that citizens would know what you were proposing with those notifications? Talk about a catch-22. If you can say either yes to either of these questions, then you, didn't, you need a lot of training, believe me. The bottom line, those five changes were illegally voted on, in my opinion. So how do we fix that? One, rerun the whole CNA individually with a proper notification. Secondly, and I like this better, put the whole matter on the November ballot and let the citizens really know what's going on and let them have a real voice. And by the way, Councilman Jimenez was right when he said the subject CNA was improperly done. In closing, I've been before you three times on what I consider violations of the Open Meetings Act. The other two had to do with improperly taking items into executive sessions, one, of the, one on the police study and the other on the sports facilities. While you have been very nice in allowing my comments, no actions resulted. Well, this violation to me is flagrant, as I've explained. As a citizen, I'm expecting more than just listening. Thus, if there's no evidence of corrective action by the beginning of next month, I will submit an official advisory request to the State Attorney General's Office. At least, you know, at least for me, I'll find out if I'm wrong. Thank you much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank, Thank you, Fred. Well said. Council Member Cantu, did you have a statement? Any other citizen comments this evening? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to item to item one uh, a consideration and action to approve the minute meetings from the regular council meeting on April the twenty seventh. Council, you have in front of you a copy of the minutes. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes. I know you've had a, a couple of days to look them over. If you have any questions or you see changes that need to be made. to accept the minutes as prepared. <coughs> I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes. I've got some. Okay. It right here says that Councilman Jimenez stated that he thought it was going to be discussed and was not proper procedure to pass these ordinances. Okay, I left the meeting after y'all voted on, on the... Should that, should that be before or after? 
I believe that Monica, you can correct me. He, he left before we. Uh, <coughs> no, he he was. There were. If you look at the, um, let me find it. Uh, where where it states that he left. That we. Okay. He voted on. It shows on the on the chart. He voted on on the twenty seventeen zero zero seven. And he voted on the. He only voted on 2017 Then he left the meeting at 724. Because if you look at the chart, he voted on the 27 ordinance 2017 And then on the other ones, he's counted absent. On each other. Because he left after that. But I didn't vote on that. No, yes, you, you voted on, on that one. Wait a minute. He left before the ordinance, right? No, he voted on that one. Because I, I, I went back and listened to the report to make sure. <coughs> Should we move that notation down under that ordinance? I can, I can change it. I can move it underneath that ordinance if you if you like I can just move that one to before 2017-008. Is that all right, Councilman Jimenez? Okay. I'll second the motion. Okay, I have a, a motion on the floor to accept the minutes with that small change um, by Councilman uh, Neeson, seconded by uh, Councilman Jimenez. Any citizens comments? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Five zero. <coughs> Moving on to uh, our presentation and discussion. Moving on to 2A annexation 2019 update. We have Chris Stewart with us. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for being with us. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor and Council. It's uh, good to be back here to see you all. Um, I'm going to provide you all uh, this evening with a uh, an update on where we are with the uh, 2019 municipal annexation plan. And this is part of a process um, that we started uh, not just last August, but um, even several years prior to that. I um, began working with the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, to develop a recommendation on areas that we knew uh, were outside the city limits, but uh, receiving uh, city services either uh, directly <coughs> in the form of utilities or indirectly um, uh, being adjacent. We also had had conversations with uh, county staff about uh, kind of the nature of our city limits jogging in and out and that being difficult uh, to administer for both the county and the city, particularly when it came to 911 uh, type issues. Um, but we began that process uh, several years ago. Um, we undertook uh, a small annexation that was uh, done under uh, what's known as the 43052H exception, uh, so fewer than 100 properties. That's how that was done. Um, but we came back and said, you know, um, we need to be strategic about this. We need to be uh, direct, and uh, so we started a uh, the, the state required uh, municipal annexation plan, and that plan. Uh, sets forth the procedure by which you establish what areas you want to annex, you establish service plans uh, for how you plan to service those areas, and then uh, you set them into the plan uh, after you hold public hearings to allow for uh, the public input, um, and then after a three-year period, once that's set, then you can start actually beginning the annexations and you have a small window there at the end of three years to make that happen. So the, the little packet I, I uh, brought for you all um, explains uh, what the municipal annexation plan does, kind of some of the policy intent, why we want to do that, um, but then also kind of carves out some of these areas and shows us, uh, you'll see a little map that folds out, uh, the colored areas are the areas that we uh, have included in the 2019 uh, municipal annexation plan. The, uh, the red dashed line is our current city limits. Um, as we began this process, uh, we went through a real thorough 
uh, uh, examination of the city maps and the deed records and everything um, and work with the surveyor to come up with the official city limits map for 2016 and that's what became our our basis um, what was the dark red I'm sorry the dark red the the dark red Non annexation development agreement on on this uh, you're talking about on this map yes. with the red and the blue so uh, another part of the law requires us to offer an agreement to any property that has an agricultural exemption. So we were required to offer them a, an agreement that says you don't have to come into the city limits if you're not if you're still working with your agricultural property. We're not going to require you to come in, uh, but we need to have an agreement about when you are ready to develop how that happens. And so that allows the city to continue to grow its boundary, that agreement does, um, to continue to grow its boundary, um, but allow the, the agricultural landowner to continue doing what they're doing and not be subject to taxes. So I understand that, but when it comes down to putting your sewer lines and everything else, if you're gonna have to come back and recap into that system because someone decides to come in to turn their, sell their property or whatever and take the exemption away, that's, that's gonna be, Pretty hard for the city to go back in and say, "Well, you know what? Uh, we got to now. We got to provide sewer and water and everything else if we don't. If we're not tapping into that system." So, so, is there something better that we could come up with? Well, for um, for some of these areas, um, we're we have to make a decision uh, when we set the final service plan about how we're going to service them, and so it may be that we leave, them, um, we leave them without sewer service um, because it wouldn't make sense to do that. And uh, because ordinarily they wouldn't require sewer service until they start development. Um, so that- But do but you follow what I'm saying? Um, it, it, I, I don't know that I okay, do. I've, I've, I've got ag property. Okay. Okay. Now I, I want it, I'm gonna put a business there. Now I want it to become city Okay. Property. I mean, just as, as is. Now, do, am I gonna have to pay for an extra service for my sewer and the water, or is it gonna be already ready for that? It depends on the service plan. If, if the service plan calls for sewer to be extended, and that sewer is extended, then you'll have that available to you, and uh, depending on how the council sets it up, you may be subject to it. Uh, Councilman, on the map that you've got, that, uh, in talking with Mindy over here, the only place that doesn't already use Floresville water or sewer is like that S that's down by the, the event center at the bottom of that. All no, the I'm other talking, red areas. I'm about the new properties. Yeah, all the other red areas already are on Floresville water and sewer, even though they're outside of the city. Okay, even the ones coming up past? Uh, uh, the ones up... Uh, River Bend? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of them have septic, some of them have sewer. We extend those services out that far. We've, we've already done that? Yes. Do they pay taxes uh, in Floresville or not? They no. don't pay taxes? No, not right now. No, but even if they did, does it go to us or is it going to stay at? It, not it, if the second that they decide to develop that property and it goes from being a ranch or, or agriculturally exempted like it is, uh, then they start paying city taxes on that portion. So if they decide to sell it to somebody that puts up a strip mall on there, suddenly that part pays taxes to the city because it's no longer ag exempt. But will the money go to the city or will yes. it stay yes. at River Bend? No, no, once once it goes, uh, becomes non-ag exempt, it comes to the city. That's not part of the TIF, as okay. they call it, the, okay. the tourist TIF area. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, yes. Mr. Menace? Okay. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So the, the various areas uh, basically reflect areas of different differing utility uh, service and differing utility availability. And so that's how we broke up the areas. The map with the red and blue that you were referring to shows those properties in the areas uh, that we know to be ag exempt. And so those properties will receive a um, non-development annexation agreement, which thankfully uh, Mr. Hug just refers to them as NDAs. Um, and those that are blue will uh, receive a regular notice of, an of annexation. 
the last page here is the schedule that we're following, and this is determined by uh, the statute. And I've updated it here a little bit to kind of show you where we're at. Um, we will have a couple of public hearings coming up next month, uh, and we're going to be working on the notice process for that uh, here uh, very shortly. Um, but you can see towards the towards the end, um, by the time we get um, uh, through the summer, after the annexation agreements are all set, those who, who wish to uh, enter into those agreements, um, then we'll prepare the final sum, uh, final service plan for each area over the winter. Um, and then we got to sit on the sidelines for a little bit. And uh, the earliest date that we can start the annexations would be in the end of August of 2019. And we'll have to have concluded those by the end of September of 2019. So that's the, the schedule, how it's got to run. Um, that's our process. This is the map that we set forward. Um, I'm going to continue to work with your city staff um, to uh, make sure that this process happens correctly. And um, I'm available for any questions at this point if you have any other questions. Anything I needed to add? Anything I missed? Uh, I don't think so. Not on this. The only potential hitch in our plan is the Texas legislature um, coming in. They, there's been legislation adopted in the Senate, it's before the House right now, that would essentially end involuntary annexation in Texas. Uh, and so if that's the case, that would change this and it would have to go to a vote of the property owners. Uh, but that's still, TML is strongly against it. Uh, we're still waiting to hear on final there. And then, but like I said, it has passed the Senate and if it passes the House, it's likely the governor would sign it. Um, so that would be a big hitch, but as for right now, this is the plan we stick to until the state changes the rules on us. Yeah. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Stewart? Thank you very much. Thank you. May I ask Chris a question? This, I'm gonna go back, Chris, and ask you a question on something else. How do we do the setup for meeting to discuss the preliminaries with the Dr. Taylor? That's not part of this agenda item, so we can talk about that after the meeting, uh, get together with the standard procedure. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item uh, 2B, uh, we have a code compliance update. Uh, our community development director, Mindy Riley. Can you hear me okay? Good evening. Um, I have our code compliance update. Um, after receiving, <coughs> excuse me, a list of addresses from PD uh, back in February, we created a spreadsheet of 50 different addresses. Um, there was originally about 100, so we're doing 50 at a time. Out of the 50, we had our code compliance um, employee <laughs> photograph them, the properties. Uh, we inspected them twice. Excuse we, me. Did you give us a paper on that or not? It should be in your packet. It's in your packet. <clears throat> should be under B. Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, we photographed the properties. We inspected them to make sure they were uh, indeed not in compliance with our city ordinances. We sent out the original letter uh, requesting that they contact the city or come into compliance. Out of the 50, 38 addresses came into compliance or contacted the city saying that they needed more time or um, they had were lived out of state and were working on coming into compliance. Out of the 52, only two citations were given for refusing to comply and uh, six addresses will be re-inspected. So we got a really good turnout um, out of the 50, 38. Uh, had contacted the city and or either or uh, came into compliance. Can you change to yellow where we can tell what is yellow and what is white? Sure. And the red one is the one that are not. The two red are the ones that the citations were given. The blue uh, will require a second inspection. And the ones in sort of yellowish white are uh, the ones that are uh, either came into compliance, contacted the city, um, you know, ask for more time. Some of them lived out of state, um, you know, were working, could only work on their properties on the weekends or um, you know, had to haul off a car or something like that. But they did contact the city in good faith to come to compliance. 
What's the process on the red ones? They are issued citations. After a citation? Then they go to, it goes to municipal court. Oh. And from what I understand, uh, one of the two has already contacted the municipal court and has agreed to meet with the judge.